Folks, everybody, welcome. Thanks a million for joining us today. Um, I've just hit record, so uh, we'll be putting this out onto the YouTube uh, channel later on this evening. Um, thanks for taking the time. Really, really appreciate it. It's been absolutely fantastic to be able to bring people together and have these conversations. So I am going to hand over to John Avoy. John, and I might ask you to give us a bit of an introduction and background, and thanks a million for taking the time today. No problem, Rose. Uh, delighted to be here and uh, great to see uh, so many people on the call and it's particularly great to see a couple of old friends that I haven't seen in a while. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, I am going to take a couple of minutes just to introduce myself. I'm going to take a minute or two norm longer than normally would. I think this session is planned for up to an hour. So I'll take three or four minutes to go back over maybe some of the, the relevant uh, parts of my life that might inform some of the stuff that I uh, might be talking about today. Uh, but like Rose said, this is an Ask Me Anything session, so this can go any, any way you like. The, uh, they started on Twitter a little while ago, whether I like uh, a salad cream or mayonnaise, so it mightn't go quite as deep as that. But, um, and even for that one, I have to warn you, I didn't have a straight answer. Um, so I'll, 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 um, I'll do my best. I suppose, you know, uh, I, I've been very fortunate over the last, um, 15 or 20 years to have a really kind of impactful and, and meaningful career, um, you know, and um, and maybe that was luck or maybe that was by design or a bit of a combination, um, you know, and, 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 and a lot of the stuff that I've been involved in over the years has brought me to here now where I recently took up the role as general manager uh, with Grow Remote. It's about five weeks to go. I think I started working here um, and, and it's brilliant and it's really exciting. Um, so yeah, I suppose my story is that I suppose very briefly born reared in, in County Wexford, um, still living in the house I grew up in, which is a farm, moved away for a few years in the meantime, all right, um, but moved back here to an, to an old farmhouse. We, we did up once I got married. Um, yeah, so the short version of my life story is I was farming up until I was in my mid-20s and I feckin' hated it. Um, and, and I couldn't wait to get away from it. So I, but I was the only son and all that on the farm. So there was a bit of cultural or family stuff to be dealt with, but uh, yeah. So, but we finally, we sold cows and we stopped up and stopped milking cows and I was around 27 and that's whatever. So 18 or 19 years ago now. So I often say I'm a recovering farmer and it's about 18 years since I farmed. Um, so, and I have no intentions of ever going back to it. Uh, so, and, and I suppose at that time as well, I, you know, I, I then had to decide what I was going to do with my life and uh, whatever. I'd been inspired by a few people to get involved work, working with, with people who had, who had helped uh, others and seen how beneficial, like, positive impact people can have in others' lives, in, including my own. So I ended up kind of, you know, been involved in lots of different things in the early days from volunteering, mentoring young lads to, you know, working with kids with autism, youth, uh, a youth cafe, uh, and things like that uh, for a few years. And uh, then I was really lucky to be involved in kind of the very early days of men's sheds in Ireland. Um, you know, and that really, I suppose, was a pivotal time uh, in my career and, and life as well. I was involved in something that I deeply cared about, that have a significant impact uh, on, on a lot of people in the country. But I also, I suppose, uh, got a lot of support at that time uh, when we were setting up that organization and uh, the support I got, like I learned a lot, a lot of, and a lot of transferable skills, I suppose, that I've been able to bring with me uh, throughout my career since. Um, so from about 2009 or 10 through to 2015 or so, I was working with men's sheds, grew phenomenally well across the country. Uh, with like loads of people uh, involved in that very much uh, kind of grassroots organization. Um, and and um, I loved it. I suppose what happened to me is I, I, I probably loved it too much. I got burnt out, uh, ended up having to take a step back, uh, another kind of big learning point in my career. And then um, again, fast forward a few years, got back doing other bits. Um, took me a while, uh, but when I did, I, um, yeah, I, 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 I did again, I did a couple of things, bits and pieces, but I really found my feet again when I got a role with Rethink Ireland, which was supporting other people who were setting up social enterprises and social initiatives 
helped them scale their ideas and their solutions to social problems. And I'd done that for a few years and that was fantastic work as well. And I suppose, you know, that opportunity really reminded me of all the help uh, that I got and, and, you know, that we got when we were setting up men's sheds in the early days. And to be able to fill, fulfill that role for others was really brilliant. And I suppose I, you know, would have never really considered myself uh, an expert in many areas. But like during that time, I did really, I suppose, went to lengths to deepen my knowledge around what's the best way to kind of support social impact initiatives and things that can make a, a big difference in the country. And one of the things during my time there a couple of years ago uh, that I heard about first when I was there was, was Grow Remote. Um, you know, I had met Tracy um, previously, uh, but um, yeah, you know, throughout all my time working with various initiatives that have the potential to have a big positive impact on Ireland, like Grow Remote stood out to me like head and shoulders. There's just a handful of things I think that you know c can literally transform this country in the same to the same scale that Grow Remote can. And um, yeah, when when the opportunity to come work here came up, I just couldn't resist it. I had a few sleepless nights because I was literally leaving a job I really really liked. Um, didn't know I'd get this job, but I just had to, had to go for it because I do firmly believe that like this opportunity is here to really put Ireland into a better place than it is now. You know. Um, through, through, you know, transforming, like, I suppose, the work ecosystem in the country, um, you know, and, and therefore, you know, making, you know, facilitating people to live and work and participate wherever they want to live and work and participate. And by doing so, like, revitalising tons of smaller towns and villages and communities across Ireland. But also people might want to live and, uh, and participate in the cities. Um, and, and that's perfect. And that's what we support too. So yeah, I suppose in terms of today, uh, I just kind of feel like, uh, yeah, really open to answer any of the questions. If there's um, if if there's one team I was thinking about that could inform like the conversation a little bit, uh, for me would be, you know, how in times of trouble, like in times of big challenges, uh, people tend to remember how important community is. So like I think men's sheds flourished at a time during the last recession when the country was on its knees and it was by people coming together in local communities and supporting each other to do something really important and amazing. And very similarly now, uh, the country is in bother again, but people are coming together, you know, as well in a different way, this time remotely and, and, and uh, you know, finding a way to, to overcome the challenges that are facing us, you know, together as community. And I think, uh, yeah, I don't know what happens as, as, as people, but I think when times are good and there's less pressure, we forget the important stuff. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the basis of like something I firmly believe, you know, that, that community can really solve big social issues, uh, but it needs to remain grassroots and we need to keep listening to the people who, who's affected by the issues. So, Will we? Will I stop talking at that, uh, Rose, and maybe see if there's any questions? That'd be great. And uh, and to answer uh, for myself, Mayo all the way, county and condiment. <laughs> Folks, anybody want to come in there with a question? And feel free to either unmute yourself or to type into the chat. And don't be shy. We don't bite. Hi, Rose. This is John Murphy here. A question for you, John. Hey, John. Like you. What would you class as being as, how would you judge your success in the first year? Like what do you, what would you hope to have achieved in the first year to make it a success? So for me, uh, joining uh, Grow Remote, John. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. I think there's two kind of layers to that. There would be the organizational successes, uh, you know, and, and, and like we're currently developing a strategic plan, which will outline, you know, our targets for the year. Uh, or, or for the next three years, but obviously they'll include targets for the year and that'll, you know, be looking at, you know, if we can start to measure how many, you know, remote jobs have we got, a, you know, a part to play in, you know, I, I suppose really in the longer term, it'd be nice, nice to be able to, you know, um, measure some of the more, more deep and meaningful stuff, like about how is this affecting, you know, this, the sustainability of uh, communities and stuff, but that's, that's very hard to do. Um, so, um, so that would be one piece, you know, and, and we can look at metrics about, you know, how many people we train or how many chapters or how many people come involved. And that's 
really important stuff and I suppose it's the way we have to know if we're, we're doing what we set out to do. But more personally, I suppose, it's um, <laughs> there's, there's one thing I was thinking about, like the time for remote working is now, like the most important thing I do is to not fuck it up, <laughs> do you know? Because uh, uh, sometimes, do you know, staying out, with it, either, I forgot that this is going to be recorded, but we'll have to do it. <laughs> Bit. but uh um yeah so that but but as well as that i think as 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 an individual like i mean there, there's pieces that i really care about like i mean you know working with the, the team who the amazing team who've brought it to this point so far you know to develop like a culture that'll stand the test of time you know that'll maintain its you know connection to community and that'll um you know be inclusive and that people will enjoy being part of and that if if people, you know, have some discretional energy, no matter how, you know, close or distant they are from the organization, but they might feel like investing that energy to do something for the community, you know, whether that, and loads of people have, and I, I'm only learning about how amazing that was since I joined, you know, people have volunteered to put the website together or the jobs board together or have reached out or have had events in their local communities and all this stuff. So it's kind of maintaining that culture, uh, I suppose is the most important thing. And then I suppose as well, any manager, I'd have a layer of, uh, you know, basic things I want to get done, like, you know, strategic plan, you know, policies, procedures, all, all the stuff to make sure the organization is in good stead to, to move forward. Excellent start, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks John. John. Right. Colin, did you want to? Yeah, uh, John, just a question in terms of, I suppose, you alluded to the uh, the chapters here and, and and the grassroots effort. If if there was one key thing that you see the chapters as being an enabler for, uh, I suppose, grow remote. How do you see the chapters being uh, a successful enabler for the overall grow remote movement? Yeah, well, I think that they are the absolute foundation of uh, grow remote. Like they're the the so there's lots of remote working initiatives in the world and training and you know you know movements and stuff well not movements but uh, different initiatives and i think what makes grow remote different from all of them is the chapters and their significant community size um i think that uh and again similar to my previous work and connections with men it's like social isolation is a is a killer literally but um for remote workers in particular you know it could become a, a real issue so having a community of people locally that you feel part of, uh, that you can connect with, you know, when it suits you and it'll be different from different people and different for different chapters. I mean, I think that that's essential to feel part of something locally. Um, and I think that's the main offering, like that Grow Remote have, that's different from anything else that I know. Um, I think, you know, we could do with having a chapter in every, like, small to medium size uh, town in the country and, you know, and, and you know, really kind of keeping those people connected at, at local level. Um, and then that's not easy. That's not easy because people involved are, are busy and they've lots going on and, you know, you know, you get involved in something for a while and then other stuff comes on. So it's maintaining that kind of energy and enthusiasm over a long period of time is a real challenge. Um, and I suppose that's what those of us and roles in particular as our community managers, like puts all our time and energy into. Um, and, and I suppose it's trying to, uh, yeah, maintain that. And, and I think it's a, it's a loop, isn't it? It's where like, the chapters learn and they feed back to us and then we share it out with the other chapters or they tell each other and then something else because you know things have to keep changing to keep relevant and to keep exciting um but yeah so i i mean we're open to any sort of suggestions about how to keep that going do you know and we're, to be as diverse and as interesting as possible uh really you're here and lots of it colin thanks a million Ailish, you want to jump in there yeah, I just wanted to say um, I was involved with the chapter in Castlebar and we would meet up on a Friday night above a pub in Castlebar and what we were asking members what were they what training needs had they or supports or how could how could we help them? We realized a lot of the people that had joined it was completely for a social life. They'd moved into the area, they'd moved out of 
Dublin. They didn't know anybody. And we were a bit at a loss because we were expecting bigger asks. Um, and I suppose everybody was converted at that stage before lockdown to the whole concept of remote. They were all working remotely, but we weren't quite equipped. Uh, or people didn't feel like if they just wanted to meet new friends or meet new people who got what they did, how could we facilitate that and make it happen? And that's my question. <laughs> how do we, how do we uh, facilitate social interaction and more so than even training supports or, um, yeah, to keep, keep people chatting to each other and keep people connected without any huge reason to be connected. Yeah, so um, I suppose that again, that's in my experience, that's kind of different for everybody, but I think it's important to, um, I mean, COVID is obviously here, so you can't even do the meeting in the pub on a Friday night now, which is re really, uh, uh, an extra challenge um, so I suppose it is for me it's like in every community there's, there's like yourself the one or two or three people who will like put the time and energy to holding that kind of space whether it is opening the door or booking the room or whatever uh, on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis and like just I suppose getting the getting the chapter everyone in the chapter to kind of acknowledge and to support that person and to buy in because I think for me then as well it's like um and again I learned this so often with men's sheds I used to come up with these notions we'll do this or this or the other thing and anytime we came up with a great idea if it didn't come from the lads in the sheds or some of the sheds and it was me or somebody else in an office coming up with the idea it didn't work basically you know and uh you know, and, and we think it would be the best idea. I had a, I had a, sorry now, I'm digressing, but I had a friend of mine who used to work in London and he had a business mentor and the business mentor used to tell him whenever he, uh, whenever he had a really brilliant idea to get down on his knees and ask God to take it away. So, um, so uh, the, I, I kind of can, can relate to that now, but um yeah, I think it's just continually kind of linking in with the, like whenever you ask people, what do you think they, they want they want to do and what can we do next? Like on a continuous kind of basis, it, it does a few things. So it like, obviously you get ideas that people actually want to do rather than you think they want to do. But you also give them, uh, you know, as well as taking their idea, you're kind of giving some responsibility that this is going to work to the other people. So if somebody comes up with an idea, they, at least they kind of have to turn up anyway. Do you know what I mean? But as well as that, you know, there's very often, and I see the culture of it here in, in Grow Remote as well, if somebody's got an idea, you're very quickly delegated that you're driving it or leading it. Um, so those, those few things make, make a difference. Um, you know, I, I think there's, a, there's, yeah, it's as simple as that because I know we could come up with lists of things and that's very useful to come up like with a list of things that all the different chapters do and share that because you might spark ideas between between each other. But really, the best ideas come from the people who are going to be participating in whatever the activity is. So there's a good, not straight answer for you. Thanks a million, Eilish. Um, and uh, actually... I love John Atkinson, what he's been doing in Wexford, like they've been having so much fun with it as well. And I think that's something that we can all embrace is having fun with those social meetups, like they're, you know, they're improvs and that uh, across Zoom. I, I would, uh, I'd like to do a bit more of that myself. Tracy Cole, did you want to ask a question? I have a question just that I would have asked John before John came into Grow Remote. He asked some very hard questions out of the bat. But we haven't even asked him that, but um, they're good, but a great answer as well. But um, before John came in, I would have asked you, um, I suppose from time to time when you are doing community stuff, you're dealing with, I suppose, the general population, like you are in kind of a retail job or whatever. And I suppose sometimes, particularly if you're volunteering your time, you feel like you're giving, giving, giving. And then if you hit kind of a hard conversation or a hard point, it's even more, it's harder than if you're in a job and you have a, a, a draining customer or something, because you just feel like I'm doing this in my spare time. Like, and I'm, it's just, it's, it's, it's even harder. So I suppose for those of us maybe who are, who are running events or running local communities and we encounter kind of difficult conversations or difficult people who might come to us say and, and give out to us about how we're doing things or there's loads of different things, I guess. And um, how, how do you handle those? I suppose, maybe how do you handle them with, with the person, but how do you handle them yourself then in terms of when you're yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so a few things in that, and we would have had plenty of experience of kind of challenging situations. So it's kind of the, I tell you what you should do, people, is one at one. So when you're really, really busy and uh, like, and you've got this big long list that you can't think you're, you'll ever get to the end of, and then somebody comes on and tells you the five things you should be doing. <coughs> Excuse me. Like that can be really hard. That can be really hard personally, even in that moment, like. So, but I have learned over a period. So a bit like what I was saying in the last answer to Eilish there is to find a way to kind of hand some of that back. So um, for example, and I know uh, maybe Jerry, you remember this when the few women's sheds in Ireland were talked about first, whatever, eight years ago or something. Like I would have had a bit of a resistance to hearing it now, to be honest, but I don't subsequently. I like anyway, if people want to know me resistance, that's another whole thing. It's nothing to do with uh, sexism or misogyny. There's a whole background sociologically to that. Anyway, uh, which I'd happily get into. But basically, um, uh, it was like my answer to that was great. Actually, women's sheds could be brilliant. Best to look, you know, we'll share our resources with you. We'll tell you how we did it. But like, we just have too much on to be starting new stuff. And um, and not too much on in a bad way. It's because we care too passionately about what we're doing now to be too distracted to try and to, to try and do other stuff. Like, because I would have went down, I would have went down that route as well, maybe trying to set up sheds for younger men, which were basically uh, youth centers, but sure there were already youth centers there. And it was the same thing with women's sheds because the resistance to that was the whole kind of men's sheds concept came because there was no men involved in community development or health promotion. Like, and we copied the idea of the women's community education movement of the late 70s and early 80s. So like, to, you know, it was kind of going back full circle. So to go around another circle just seemed like an awful waste of energy to me at the time. But I did realize subsequently that like some people prefer different things and, and it's fine and it works really well for some people. So it's that thing of handing it back to people and go, Jesus, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great idea. Best to look with it. And we're focused on this, this and this right now. Um, uh, that's one part of it but there, there is another part of it that's really like I also remember uh, like being at home and even talk, Sarah as my wife uh, like talking to Sarah about stuff that had gone on during the day and been really like like down because you think you're doing your best but obviously you're not like because people are pissed off at you uh, but then realising that that's a, a tiny minority of the people like in, 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 in Grow Remote, for example, and thousands of remote workers who might have some connection with Grow Remote, like, you know, the vast majority of them are probably neutral. A nice proportion probably love Grow Remote. And it's only a tiny proportion probably have something negative to say. But unfortunately, it's the people who shout the loudest get the attention, you know. And, and uh, I suppose it's trying to remember that and keeping, keeping that stuff in context. And one thing is for sure, and you hear this, like, you'll never please all of the people all of the time, you know. Thanks, John. Thanks a million, Tracy. I can't even please myself most of the time, like, so, you know, why would you? That's such a great point to make um, around community. And I think that's something we could all do remembering um, is that there's so many other people out there that we've helped and influenced that we probably aren't even aware of um, at all sorts of different levels. Would anybody else like to hop in there with a question? Martin? It's on mute there now at the moment, Martin. So if you see where the little, um, it looks like a microphone. The joys of technology. My connection's really bad. I'm, I'm dropping in and out all the time. Oh, so Martin McDevitt, do you want to jump in with a question and Martin, Martin Smith can get himself sorted? Oh. No, I thought you were talking to me. No, um, do you, did you want to come in with a question, Martin? No, I was going to just... Perfect. Did anybody else want to jump in with a question while Martin Smith gets himself sorted? Can you unmute him? Um, I can't, I can only ask. Ah. John, can you? No, I think, no I'm, yeah. I'm the host. That's just, that's as much option as you have as host. But John, can I ask you? Yeah. Sorry, oh, sorry, Jim. Do you oh. mind if Martin goes ahead with his question? Thank you. No problem. And we'll come back to you. Thanks a million, Jim. How are you, John? How are you, Martin? How are you? 
I'm not too bad at all. I remember the time we met Baloo and Killarney at the AGM. <laughs> that was one of the days I was thinking about when we said we got hassle. I was just thinking if Tracy is still there, some of the hassle that day, there was people going to fight and everything, sure. <laughs> <laughs> there had to be fellas put out and everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, over that, I'll tell you, John, no, just, uh, I like the idea of this uh, grow remote. And I was just thinking, do you think it's a good time now to get it, to push it, while the pandemic is, is with us? Yeah, a- absolutely. I think that, um, I think that, like, remote working was starting to happen anyway. But now with the pandemic, like, and so many people working from home, it's an ideal time. Obviously, there's the added challenge that you can't bring people together to have a meeting locally. Of, you're, you know, so you're in Westmead, aren't you? That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, like, if you were to bring, like, put a whatever no, local notes to try and get remote workers locally together uh, to see how they can, you know, form a bit of a community, like, that's added, added difficult right now because of the, the restrictions. But really, it's also the time that pre- people probably need the support most. So, I think, even, I think even getting the ball rolling on it, like, letting people know that there's something happening uh, might give them a bit of interest and hope. Um, because you obviously have to you have to manage that thing so, uh, of uh, the restrictions. Um, like one of the things that um, is interesting as well is because remote workers spend so much time online. It's like when they come together uh, in their local communities, it's kind of ideal if it's not online. You know that they get a break from that and they can actually meet up. Uh, but that's not to say like online stuff doesn't work. You know, uh, but I think people just especially if you're, if you're working like in any sort of isolated way, just meeting up with other people for a bit of crack is, is, is you know, and of something of shared interest is brilliant. Yeah, that's something I would be thinking about, yeah, absolutely. Thanks a million, Martin, and um, lo- lovely to have you here. Hopefully we'll, we'll, see, we'll see more of you. Okay, thanks, Rose. Jim, do you want to jump in there now? Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, hi, John, thanks very much for coming on. Um, have you done any trainings that you've found useful to help you put together things like the the man shed operation and going forward with Grow Remote? Um, because I'm very interested in developing a chapter here in the back end of County Galway. But um, it would be nice to have at least some backbone structure to work with. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. So uh, two answers to that. So firstly, yeah, at Grow Remote and uh, Rose is leading out on it, we have training for people at the chapter leads and people setting up chapters, uh, you know, so, so that's there and available to you. And uh, I'd say suggest stay in touch with Rose. Um, but in terms of training I've done over the years, yeah, I was heavily involved. I mean, even in the last job in, in providing training to our, our like supports to people who were doing social stuff as the overall kind of uh, the technical name for it, but people who are setting, you know, working in social innovations or community stuff or social enterprises. Um, and I find that like, it's one of those things um, where you don't know what you don't know. And then when you hear about things, they seem really obvious, you know? So, so definitely getting the appropriate training or the little insights from others. Uh, used to say that back in the day with men's heads and I'd say Jerry probably heard me saying this 500 times. And I don't know, he's probably done it more than I have now at this stage as well. And Kevin there as well. But, um, you know, that like the first thing you do is go visit another shed. So in this case, may go visit another chapter when they're having an event. But ideally, if you could bring two or three people with you from your locality who might be uh, chapter members as well, because actually like that spin in the car when you're going to the other event is probably the best meeting you'll ever have because you'll be coming back and you'll be thinking about, what you do differently or what you do the same or how great it was or whatever. Uh, so that would be something we used to, uh, we, we recommend is like, you could go visit a, an event from another chapter and bring a few people with you, even if it means an hour or two's drive, I think is worth it. That's brilliant. <clears throat> I suppose the other thing I have a question about is, uh, Grow Remote, um, it's got to appeal across various generations. So we've got, the, the older generation like me have been re- around working uh, very physically for many years. And then we get, uh, go over to Generation Z or X or Y or Z or whatever we're coming, we're coming to. 
and they're a very different mindset in terms of you know, they want to be more online with the phones and stuff like that. Um, are you are we aiming to grow remote as at a particular sec section of that demographic, or is it open to everyone that wants to come? No, no, it's it's open to it's open to everybody. And again, I suppose it is a diverse community. Uh, but I think that diversity is a strength. Um, um, I, I suppose like any kind of communities, so though, you, if you set something up locally uh, where everybody is welcome, and I think it's important that everybody's welcome, uh, but within that, you'll find yourself, you know, I suppose, hanging around or chatting to the people who may have similar interests or whatever, or, you know, as, as yourself. Because, you know, I, I do, I find it even, I mean, I don't think I'm an old at a but I do find it challenging even like, you know, some of the, the how fluent people are talking about different technologies and stuff uh, at, at the minute like and you know if you don't know if you don't know that stuff it can be a little bit like um exclusionary or whatever uh but i suppose there maybe the maybe the grow remote chapters are an opportunity to share to share all that stuff and to learn a bit uh about it but no i think i think the chapters have to be open to everybody but that doesn't mean that each chapter doesn't like develop its own like personality you know and that different people are attracted yeah thanks a million for that jim and another big one on that is what we've seen through experience is a chapter will set up and you invite people it's it's the simplest thing and it maybe seems too simple but invite everybody to have a coffee so online at the moment and chat and find out what the needs are and it's in that conversation so even now i'm living in ballina for the last year and a half and we had a coffee meet up last autumn and something i found quite interesting was a lot of the people there we're missing being able to connect with our teams. This is long before COVID, like, you know, but they just happened to be working remotely and they wanted that group to take over, say, from the kind of sports and social group that they would have had within the, the corporation. And they were actually very interested in looking at using the chapter to get out and do volunteering. Now, obviously, that hasn't been possible this year, but it's something that we look at doing um, next year for the chapter here in Ballina is giving people that scope to, to get out and get involved in the community uh, through that. Thanks a million. Claire made a great point, actually. We meet every Tuesday, so at three o'clock today for a coffee. And it's a lovely casual meetup. Now, the link is in our Slack. Okay, Slack's another platform. So like Twitter or Facebook or whatnot, it's a communi communication platform. But if you go to growmote.ie, you'll see join our Slack. And it's totally free to do. You need an email address to do it. But if you join up to that, and you want to come along, it's in the water cool channel. If anybody is interested in joining and isn't very comfortable or familiar with Slack, send me an email. I'll put my email address now in the chat and I can help you get them set up. But it's a lovely meetup. It's every week at three o'clock. It's very, very casual and relaxed, but it's a great way to connect with people. And um, Kevin Brady, did you want to come in with a question there? Um, yes, um, John, it's, it's nine, nine years since we had the first fun conversation now would you believe Cheers. and uh, I wish you well in your new venture and if uh, if you get tired of it you're very welcome back to the men's sheds <laughs> John <coughs> the remote idea is a great idea but there's a lot of challenges I suppose with every idea and the greatest challenge that I see is getting people to come together to help and support and join in to doing something and this is more common than in rural areas. In towns you have population, but out in rural areas you have no population. And they're stagnant in their views and stagnant in their ways of going forward. And they're, they're watching you. If you come up with an idea, a great idea, as you said before, Johnny, you're, you're very, it was very well taught out whoever said that, that God take the great idea away. But when you come up with a great idea, to get people to actually come on board with you and, and follow that that idea through is a huge task. Have you any uh, or did anybody ever come up with a solution as to how you get people more involved in following yeah. that idea? I don't know if it's a new idea but definitely I've thought about this a lot over the years and I mean one of the things I think that's kind of unique about Grow Remote in this respect because even though our ambition is to like help you know, uh, all towns and villages, will, you know, if you think, I'm thinking particularly where you're from, they're small, rural or, or, or smaller towns to, to revive and become social, uh, become sustainable, like socially and economically. Um, 
So there'll be a lot of kind of historical community activity like GEA clubs or whatever that uh, have their group of people that come together and they invest their time and energy into that. So starting something new was hard. Um, but I suppose what's different about Grow Remote is that like we are looking at a different cohort of people typically and that they are very often like people who are working remotely in the community that you mightn't even know are there or like it's kind of hidden employed that are working from home or whatever. So uh, they might be all too interested uh, in coming together to do something. It's just that it's very hard to know who they are and they're, they're not the typical in, I mean, this is a big sweeping statement, some of them are, of course, but it's not necessarily typically the same people who are involved in the existing community things. Um, so it's, it's finding a way to reach out to them, I think is really important. Um, and trying to bring them together. It might mean having your event on a different way or communicating it differently or, 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 or whatever. I think as well as that, like uh, there is an opportunity now because uh, of remote working um, so that there's like lots of people who might typically have been commuting to the cities who don't do that right now. So that they've got those extra uh, couple of hours in the evening, for example, where they're not in their car. And that like, the, the research does show that like uh, people spend a good bit of that time, I don't know what the percentage is, they actually work more than they used to because they're not in their cars or commuting, but they also have other discretionary time that they invest into their communities. Um, and whether, you know, and how do you kind of harvest that, if you like? So maybe it's at that time where people would have been typically commuting, uh, you know, at half five in the evening, there's a short event or whatever, a community walk around. Uh, I remember I met you on time at a at a hurling pitch or a football pitch. Uh, like, a very, you know, do you get the community doing a walk at the same time around the pitch there or something? And and targeting different people, you know. And I uh, I suppose it's uh, finding ways to do that. And then I think one of the things that um, definitely learned over the years is like too many meetings without action, like just turns people off. Um, so if you have a meeting about setting up stuff, something needs, you know, there need to be some action, there needs to be some progress before the next meeting and the next meeting, like subsequent meetings where there's people talking about doing stuff, just you lose people quick enough. Um, and then the other thing I, I have often uh, noticed uh, is like, you have to be really self-aware um, when you're doing this stuff because um, you know, there's sometimes there's the situation where I might actually be the problem that people are not coming. You'd often hear about, can never get anyone to join this committee. Sure, I'm the chairperson for the last 25 years and you can never get anyone new to join it. Like, you know, and yeah. like, so maybe it's time to have a bit of a look at that, you know, uh, uh, and, and, there, and that's definitely happened in plenty of parishes across the country, you know, where there might be, like with the best of intentions in the world, from, from the community leaders, but like it might be actually that, like they, they love that role and they don't want people, you know, how they feel taken over or whatever, but they might actually want, you know, it's a challenge. So, so, so there's all those things, um, there's all those things. But again, it kind of swings back around to isn't it, asking people what they want to do and then facilitating that uh, rather than, uh, rather than kind of having, you know, one of the greatest reasons things fail is because people, when people are asked, why do they do something? And the answer is because that's the way we always did it. That's the solution. You know, that's a, that's a road to, to the end, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> do, you, do you find that there's a, that, or have, has anybody come up with a formula as to how to get the community development agencies to become involved because <clears throat> to get links to funding or anything like that seems to be a complicated process for most projects <clears throat> and most uh, deserving projects seem to get pushed onto the back burner maybe, maybe because you're not approaching the local development companies right or whatever I don't know but it, it, have you worked any formula with I might jump in on that Kevin actually because say for ourselves it's something we've never been focused on like our thing from day dot was this was a community project and there was so much that we can do as individuals in our own communities and we were never going to wait for government or anybody else to step in and um, one of the quotes I love is we are the people we've been waiting for 
And like, look, at, we've been absolutely fantastic. Mm. The people within the community out there that have done so much are still doing so much. Like, that's what we're relying on. We're looking at what we can change. We're not waiting for the, for, you know, organizations or anything else to step in and, and do uh, anything for us. And how much was achieved within this group of people over the last couple of years, long before funding came along, I think is just yeah. absolutely inspirational. And not that you don't pay attention to some of that, but that you know that there's so much you can do in spite of it, you know. Um, yeah. Kevin, thanks a million for that. And we had, um, Renata just wanted to come in on the question there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, John, listen, uh, super insights. I mean, your, your battle weary experience is definitely showing through in, in all of the nuances and the, you know, the, the specific ways of handling situations that you only get through day to day experience. And, um, you know, we talked earlier on about the community and I, and we talked about, you know, um, local shops and things. And I have this vision of a grow remote poster in every local shop shop window like there's an empty building in all the small towns or whatever with it with a link into you know like the slack community or the local chapter but um when you were sort of running the men's shed what i'm interested in is um what how you went about um uh, spreading the message about the men's shed and did you partner with other local organizations on the ground within the communities to help to get that message so was there partnering with local organizations on the ground? How, how did you go about that, like spreading that message? Um, yeah, so yes and no. So I suppose what we learned really early on is that like each community and each group were different. So in some places we did, and you know, in some places the, the sheds were driven by uh, a few fellas who wanted to come together. Very often, like actually the first initiation call was from a woman like back, this was like in the early days during the recession when like I often got calls or emails from women who were worried about their uncles or their husbands mm -hmm. or uh, who were at a loose end but had never really any experience of not working before. Uh, you know, as sometimes then after a year or two when the uh, initiative caught on, like it started to be driven maybe in some cases by community development projects or by local development companies. Um, so they were all quite different. And I think the main thing again was like, you know, to facilitate each group to do it the way they saw it best, but also by sharing the experience of what worked in other places. Um, yeah, so I think, I think again, it, it's, not, it's not a straight answer. Like, I mean, the, like we did some national campaigns and stuff, mm. but I actually don't know how successful they were overall. I think the best success was like word of mouth and when people who really care about something is talking about it to somebody else. Uh, like, and we, we did develop like systems and structures to, uh, you know, support some of those lads and a couple of them are here that were like really cared about it and how they became the advocates in their local communities and put some energy behind that. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I don't, I, I still, I really don't think that there's one kind of solution that fits all. Uh, but like, but everything worked, like everything worked to a degree. So it's kind of like, you know, putting a certain, putting energy into things like it's the old day, the old adage of what you put into it, you get out of it. So if a group puts the energy into like getting a few quid together to do a radio ad or a, an ad in the local paper or put something in the local newsletter or just goes around knocking on doors of people that they think might be interested. All of that has results. So, and I suppose it comes back to like, there's a direct relationship between how much energy goes into it, you know, and the outcome that comes out of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's great. Yeah, thanks very much, John. Thank you. No, no worries. Thanks, Renata. Um, anybody else want to hop in with a question? I might ask a question while we're waiting. Sorry, John, I'll just two seconds. Right. Question I wrote down earlier. Um, John Avoy. What do you think we could be doing to empower more people around social enterprises in Ireland? Uh, yeah, very interesting. So this is obviously another bit of a passionate, uh, like, so I suppose main thing is education that like people don't consider, like when people have an idea to set up a business, like many people do, uh, and they're passionate about a business or are passionate about an idea that they don't really consider a social enterprise as one of the options that it's usually like people either think if it's a social idea, they want to set up a charity or if it's a, 
if it's a, if it's a business idea, they'll set up a for-profit business, which is completely legitimate. Uh, but in many cases, like um, a more optimum uh, like solution to that would be a social enterprise, which uh, which is how Grow Remote was run. Um, you know, and and um, yeah, so I think there's a big awareness piece that needs to be done around that. Uh, and I think as well as that, like, but there also needs to be a shift within the social enterprise kind of community to move away from the charity model, if you like, where, for example, there's a thing where if you're, it's almost like if you're doing uh, work that's meaningful, you shouldn't be getting properly paid. So I have to laugh, like, so, for example, some of those uh, computer games, um, I won't think of the famous one, but like it's where you have to pretend to be a criminal and you go around murdering people and robbing cars and all. And like the fella who made that is making, or the company, making billions and are congratulated for being entrepreneurs and how amazing they are. But like if somebody is coming along counseling kids, they should be doing it for free and they shouldn't be getting paid for it. Like, um, and like, so like I think we have to break that a kind of myth, particularly for younger, talented people who have a career ahead of them that like, like it's okay to get properly paid if you're doing good work. And like, there's tech solutions that kids can come up with. Like, and I'm just saying kids, cause typically, you know, I suppose I, I, I'm not that old, but I feel like I'm not, never going to be coming up with the next Facebook anyway at this stage. Um, John, you're at the exact, you're just about the right age to be an entrepreneur, it's, isn't it? It's, it's that sort of period of life is when uh, most entrepreneurs, so uh, don't, be, don't be selling yourself short. I, I might look younger than I am. <laughs> and anyway, so um yeah so i think that's one of the things that we need to like inc like like create a new normal where it's okay to make a good living uh you know and fulfill your kind of material dreams and goals as well as your social ones all all together you know um so that so that'd be one thing and and then there's some nuancey stuff like i think there's legal forms like you can only uh, right now you know, there's company limited by shares or there's company limited by guarantees or, or cooperatives are really the only way you can set up a, a trading organization in Ireland with like, and, and none of them are really ideal for social enterprises. You know, for, for example, you know, um, in, in, in for-profit business, like it's perfectly legitimate to be a managing director and to be the chair of a board of your, an organization that you founded and get properly paid for it. And you can't do that in a social enterprise, you know which is kind of, you know, it's silly in my opinion. And it's different from a charity. There has to be a clear line between charities and social enterprises as well, because I understand how, like, the, you know, if people are donating to charity, they need to, that, that has to be really transparent where that money goes and that it goes on, you know, the activity that the organization is set up to first and foremost and all that stuff. Here, here. Thanks, John. John Murphy, did you want to hop in there? Yeah. I mean, one thing I was going to say, John, if you don't mind, is that, that definitely it's important for all of the chapters to remember that you're not working in isolation, that you do actually have other chapters you can reach out to, especially neighbouring ones, and make those connections somehow. But another easy question for you, John, actually, is, is that it seems to be a lot easier to get in remote workers than businesses interested in remote working. Any thoughts or suggestions on actually how we get more businesses involved in, in Grow Remote or more, more visibility on businesses? Um, yeah, I, so I think you're dead right, though, that it is more challenging. I think that, like, some companies are um, are set up for remote working and, like, you know, a small number of, like, mainly tech companies and they're fully distributed and, 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 um, and that's great. But I think that the organisations that have been, like, typically offices or bricks and mortar where people go to a location, they have a big challenge in transitioning. And I'm sure there's a lot of fear in management about how this can go wrong. And there's a lot of nuanced stuff that hasn't really been trashed out or that won't have answers to yet. Like such as like, you know, insurance claims. If insurance start, claims start coming in from people who are working from home, that could change everything, for example. Or, uh, you know, if... Um, yeah, for if, if organizations, maybe if trade unions might have a strong opinion on certain things, and I don't know, I haven't got into that in much detail. But again, that could, so I think there's, I think that a lot of companies uh, probably have resistance to like 
engaging in that really deep level about the challenges that are really going to make this work, uh, you know, because it could open up a can of worms. But I think that's a bridge, and I think that's a, a, a bridge we have to cross, and I think it's a, you know, a can of worms that we do have to open up and dive into, and I think it'll be fine when we do, to be honest. I think they're all only relatively small problems that taken individually their solutions to. Yeah. It is that thing, actually, if stop talking about it, actually, and t start doing something. Yeah. Hit that first step. John Murphy, you're fantastic. And thanks a million for that kind offer of, of sharing your experience and knowledge there between Ennis and Limerick. It's, it's, it, it, it's so much about what we're doing is learning from each other and sharing that. Um, just to mention, by the way, um, Renata kind of signaled it to me. We have a fantastic channel in the Slack started up in the last few months sharing information for employers. So if anybody is an employer dealing with uh, moving remotely or wanting to improve what they have in place, there is a lot of great information being shared there around working with your team, um, engagement and legislation. So again, if anybody is interested in joining the Slack, go on to growremote.ie. And if you're just wanting a little bit of guidance, because it does take a little bit of finagle and um, give me an email and I'd be more than happy to help. Did anybody else want to jump in there with a question? Martin? Sorry, no, because I've muted you again there. Apologies. Sorry, you're on mute there, Martin, again. No, there you are. Great stuff. Right. Yeah, just one for John there. Uh, the cooperative model, I suppose, was a, was a remote type of model back in the, in the 40s and early 50s. And uh, it, it, it could gather up share capital to make it vibrant. Would you think that would be a road to take? and create an information hub through the cooperative body? Um, <laughs> that's, that is a hard question now, because, because I've looked into this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so setting up co-ops in Ireland is very complicated anyway, compared to setting up another type of company. Uh, and I think, uh, basically, there, there's two types of the very, there's two types of co-ops then as well. There's the for-profit ones and the non-profit. So the for-profit ones would be the big ones, like, you know, that the Lambies and stuff before they became a PLC, uh, where, you know, there were, there were economic uh, cooperatives and like money was distributed to shareholders. But then there's the non, a non-profit one, uh, which I think is a very interesting model. And the difference is that like, if there is some profit, it doesn't get distributed to shareholders. It goes back into running the, you know, fulfilling the social mission. Um, I think, I think they're amazing if they work. Like, so if you could have a distributed model where everybody had shared ownership in a real genuine actually owned it model rather than lip service to it model, I think that would be fantastic. I think it's just just complicated. I think like you see the site the, the amount of governance and stuff to go in to make that work. Um, you nearly need like you you'd need a full time person doing the governance bit before you ever did a tap of anything else really. Uh, but there's some people looking into it. So just for, for um, reference, uh, if people are interested, there's a couple that really work in Ireland. So there's the Dublin Food Co-op uh, and there's uh, the guys actually near Rose there in Attenroy, Amacitia, even though they're not a cooperative right now, they're putting a lot of energy into, into working out how this new model of non-profit co-ops with where every stakeholder is an equal owner would actually work. And it's actually something we might, Rose, I'm thinking, uh, get Patrick to talk about sometime. It could be very That's interesting. I'm thinking about that. Yeah, Martin, it's something I'm hugely interested in as well. There was a lovely example, actually, and I think it might have been this summer, um, worker-owned co cooperative for carers, um, for home carers, she set up in Dublin, and they seem to be doing really, really well. What what I've seen from the um, examples in America, they do seem to need a bit of uh, funding support for the first few years to become financially secure, and then they work really, really well. I think that that's going to be a huge part of us having more sustainable economies. Yeah, what, what made me think about that, Rose, was uh, the one in Tipperary where the lady set up on the village stuff was dying on his feet. The mm. village has gone, and she started a cooperative and got in 10 or 12 members got her running, and now it's a hugely successful operation. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I think we'll need to have a, a conversation about that alone, because um, I, I do think it's something that we'd love to see shared across more communities to see what's possible. Um, well, 
I suppose it depends on the type of part of the country you're from. I know in Cavan Monaghan, the cooperative movement would thrive in the 50s and 60s. And I suppose it, if it's a model to go by, it's the type of people that are there yeah. that, that play into that type of a model. You yeah. know, it might, it might work everywhere else, but it, it, there, are, there are places it could be. Absolutely. The more sustainability we can build into our economies, the better again, you know. Folks, I, I recognise we're just about to go, but before we finish, I wanted to ask John one last question. John Avoy, what excites you about the future of community in Ireland? Oh, geez. I, I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's looking back to look forward as well. And I suppose when we look back, we t people talk about the good old days, but actually you know, those people who are there, they might have, they mightn't have been that good. But um, there's definitely, like, I think any crisis like we're going through at the minute tends to bring people together. And, you know, if we could use that catalyst to kind of maintain but like a vibrancy around communities and, you know, Tracy is there often talks about, um, you know, renovating or kind of revitalizing the main street of small towns, small towns now where you walk along and there's like two thirds of the shops are closed, you know, um, you know, if they could be buzzing again, you know, with different colors and different sounds coming out of them and, you know, and I think remote work is such a huge part to play in that because, you know, I know we mightn't have the weather for it, but like, I love the idea of people, are, you know, working on their laptops and going for coffees and you might spend an hour or two in one place and go on to another place for an hour or two. But you get your days worked on and you've been social, but you've also contributed to the social kind of the, econo the economic sustainability of the town you're in. I, I think think I think that's uh, it'd be a nice vision. Uh, yeah, as long as we can keep the, the rain away, we'll have a chance. I just said that's what the awnings are for. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of awnings and we'll be sorted. John, thanks a million for taking the time today. Uh, thanks everybody else for joining us. Um, there's loads of different ways you can connect with us. We're on different social media, so you'll get it on Facebook and Twitter. And again, if anybody would like to join the Slack, so you'd like to join the coffee, we'll be meeting at three o'clock now this evening. Do please drop me an email and I can give you a hand in getting sorted there. Um, please do engage with us, ask questions, get involved. Thanks for coming today and we we'll look forward to seeing you more around and hope everyone has a great week. And Rose, just I, I, I assume everybody knows, but if they don't, how does somebody...